Chapter 15 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 15 my master died in the month of May, and I followed him to his grave with a heavy heart, for I felt that I had lost the only friend I had in the world who possessed at once the power and the inclination to protect me against the tyranny and oppression to which slaves on a cotton plantation are subject. Had he lived, I should have remained with him, and never have left him for he had promised to purchase the residue of my time of my owners in Carolina. But when he was gone, I felt the parting of the last tie that bound me to the place where I then was, and my heart yearned for my wife and children, from whom I had now been separated more than four years. I held my life in small estimation if it was to be worn out under the dominion of my mistress and her brothers, though since the death of my master she had greatly ameliorated my condition by giving me frequent allowances of meat and other necessaries. I believe she entertained some vague apprehensions that I might run away and betake myself to the woods for a living, but I do not think she ever suspected that I would hazard the untried undertaking of attempting to make my way back to Maryland. My purpose was fixed, and now nothing could shake it. I only waited for a proper season of the year to commence my toilsome and dangerous journey. As I must of necessity procure my own subsistence on my march, it behoved me to pay regard to the time at which I took it up. I furnished myself with a firebox, as it is called, that is, a tin case containing flints, steel, and tinder. This I considered indispensable. I took the great coat that my master had given me, and with a coarse needle and thread quilted a scabbard of old cloth in one side of it, in which I could put my sword and carry it with safety. I also procured a small bag of linen that held more than a peck. This bag I filled with the meal of parched corn, grinding the corn after it was parched in the woods where I worked at the mill at night. These operations, except the grinding of the corn, I carried on in a small conical cabin that I had built in the woods. The boots that my master gave me I had repaired by a Spaniard who lived in the neighborhood and followed the business of a cobbler. Before the first of August I had all my preparations completed, and had matured them with so much secrecy that no one in the country, white or black, suspected me of entertaining any extraordinary design. I only waited for the corn to be ripe and fit to be roasted, which time I had fixed as the period of my departure. I watched the progress of the corn daily, and on the 8th of August I perceived, on examining my mistress's field, that nearly half the ears were so far grown that by roasting them a man could easily subsist himself, and as I knew that this corn had been planted later than most of the corn in the country, I resolved to take leave of the plantation and its tenants forever on the next day. I had a faithful dog, called True Man, and this poor animal had been my constant companion for more than four years, without ever showing cowardice or infidelity but once, and that was when the panther followed us from the woods. I was accordingly anxious to bring my dog with me, but as I knew the success of my undertaking depended on secrecy and silence, I thought it safest to abandon my last friend, and engage in my perilous enterprise alone. On the morning of the ninth I went to work as usual, carrying my dinner with me, and worked diligently at grubbing until about one o'clock in the day. I now sat down and took my last dinner as the slave of my mistress, dividing the contents of my basket with my dog. After I had finished, I tied my dog with a rope to a small tree. I set my gun against it, for I thought I should be better without the gun than with it, tied my knapsack with my bag of meal on my shoulders, and then turned to take a last farewell of my poor dog, 
that stood by the tree to which he was bound, looking wistfully at me. When I approached him, he licked my hands, and then rising on his hind feet and placing his forepaws on my breast, he uttered a long howl, which thrilled through my heart as if he had said, My master, do not leave me behind you. I now took to the forest, keeping as nearly as I could a north course all afternoon. Night overtook me before I reached any water course, or any other object worthy of being noticed, and I lay down and slept soundly without kindling a fire or eating anything. I was awake before day, and as soon as there was light enough to enable me to see my way, I resumed my journey and walked on, until about eight o'clock, when I came to a river, which I knew must be the Appalachie. I sat down on the bank of the river, opened my bag of meal, and made my breakfast of a part of its contents. I used my meal very sparingly, it being the most valuable treasure that I now possessed, though I had in my pocket three Spanish dollars, but in my situation this money could not avail me anything, as I was resolved not to show myself to any person, either white or black. After taking my breakfast I prepared to cross the river, which was here about a hundred yards wide, with a sluggish and deep current. The morning was sultry, and the thickets along the margin of the river teemed with insects and reptiles. By sounding the river with a pole I found the stream too deep to be waded, and I therefore prepared to swim it. For this purpose I stripped myself and bound my clothes on the top of my knapsack, and my bag of meal on the top of my clothes. Then, drawing my knapsack close up to my head, I threw myself into the river. In my youth I had learned to swim in the Patuxent, and have seldom met with any person who was more at ease in deep water than myself. I kept a straight line from the place of my entrance into the Appalachie to the opposite side, and when I had reached it stepped upon the margin of the land, and turned round to view the place from which I had set out on my aquatic passage. But my eye was arrested by an object nearer to me than the opposite shore. Within twenty feet of me, in the very line that I had pursued crossing the river, a large alligator was moving, in full pursuit of me, with his nose just above the surface, in the position that creature takes when he gives chase to his intended prey in the water. The alligator can swim more than twice as fast as a man, for he can overtake young ducks on the water, and had I been ten seconds longer in the river, I should have been dragged to the bottom and never again been heard of. Seeing that I had gained the shore, my pursuer turned, made two or three circles in the water close by me, and then disappeared. I received this admonition as a warning of the dangers that I must encounter in my journey to the north. After adjusting my clothes, I again took to the woods, and bore a little to the east of north it now being my determination to turn down the country, so as to gain the line of the roads by which I had come to the south. I travelled all day in the woods, but a short time before sundown came within view of an opening in the forest, which I took to be cleared fields, but upon a closer examination, finding no fences or other enclosures around it, I advanced into it and found it to be an open savannah, with a small stream of water creeping slowly through it. At the lower side of the open space were the remains of an old beaver dam, the central part of which had been broken away by the current of the stream at the time of some flood. Around the margin of this former pond I observed several decayed beaver lodges, and numerous stumps of small trees that had been cut down for the food or fortifications of this industrious little nation, which had fled at the approach of the white man, and all its people were now, like me, seeking refuge in the deepest solitudes of the forest, from the glance of every human eye. As it was growing late, and I believed I must now be near the settlements, I determined to encamp for the night beside this old beaver dam. I again took my supper from my bag of meal, and made my bed for the night amongst the canes that grew in the place. This night I slept but little, for it seemed as if all the owls in the country had assembled in my neighborhood to perform a grand musical concert, 
their hooting and chattering commenced soon after dark, and continued until the dawn of day. In all parts of the southern country the owls are very numerous, especially along the margins of streams, and in the low grounds with which the waters are universally bordered. But since I had been in the country, although I had passed many nights in the woods at all seasons of the year, I had never before heard so clamorous and deafening a chorus of nocturnal music. With the coming of the morning I arose from my couch, and proceeded warily along the woods, keeping a continual lookout for plantations, and listening attentively to every noise that I heard in the trees or amongst the cane brakes. When the sun had been up for two or three hours, I saw an appearance of blue sky at a distance through the trees, which proved that the forest had been removed from a spot somewhere before me, and at no great distance from me. And as I cautiously advanced, I heard the voices of people in loud conversation. Sitting down amongst the palmetto plants that grew around me in great numbers, I soon perceived that the people whose conversation I heard were coming nearer to me. I now heard the sound of horses' feet, and immediately afterwards saw two men on horseback, with rifles on their shoulders, riding through the woods and moving on a line that led them past me at a distance of about fifty or sixty yards. Perceiving that these men were equipped as hunters, I remained almost breathless for the purpose of hearing their conversation. When they came so near that I could distinguish their words, they were talking of the best place to take a stand for the purpose of seeing the deer, from which I inferred that they had sent men to some other point for the purpose of rousing the deer with dogs. After they had passed that point of their way that was nearest to me, and were beginning to recede from me, one of them asked the other if he had heard that a negro had run away the day before yesterday in Morgan County to which his companion answered in the negative. The first then said he had seen an advertisement at the store which offered a hundred dollars reward for the runaway, whose name was Charles. The conversation of these horsemen was now interrupted by the cry of hounds, at a distance in the woods, and heightening the speed of their horses they were soon out of my sight and hearing. Information of the state of the country through which I was travelling was of the highest value to me, and nothing could more nearly interest me than a knowledge of the fact that my flight was known to the white people who resided round about and before me. It was now necessary for me to become doubly vigilant, and to concert with myself measures of the highest moment. The first resolution that I took was that I would travel no more in the daytime, this was the season of hunting deer, and knowing that the hunters were under the necessity of being as silent as possible in the woods, I saw at a glance that they would be at least as likely to discover me in the forest before I could see them, as I should be to see them before I myself could be seen. I was now very hungry, but exceedingly loath to make any further breaches on my bag of meal, except in extreme necessity. Feeling confident that there was a plantation within a few rods of me, I was anxious to have a view of it, in hope that I might find a cornfield upon it from which I could obtain a supply of roasting ears. Fearful to stand upright, I crept along through the low ground where I then was, at times raising myself to my knees for the purpose of obtaining a better view of things about me. In this way I advanced until I came in view of a high fence and beyond this saw cotton, tall and flourishing, but no sign of corn. I crept up close to the fence, where I found the trunk of a large tree that had been felled in clearing the field. Standing upon this, and looking over the plantation, I saw the tassels of corn, at the distance of half a mile, growing in a field which was bordered on one side by the wood in which I stood. It was now nine or ten o'clock in the morning and as I had slept but little the night before, I crept into the bushes, great numbers of which grew in and about the top of the fallen tree, and hungry as I was, fell asleep. When I awoke, it appeared to me from the position of the sun, which I had carefully noted before I lay down, to be about one or two o'clock. As this was the time of the day when the heat is most oppressive, and when every one was most likely to be absent from the forest, 
I again moved, and taking a circuitous route at some distance from the fields, reached the fence opposite the cornfield without having met anything to alarm me. Having cautiously examined everything around me, as well by the eye as by the ear, and finding all quiet, I ventured to cross the fence and pluck from the standing stalks about a dozen good ears of corn, with which I stole back to the thicket in safety. This corn was of no use to me without the fire to roast it, and it was equally dangerous to kindle fire by night as by day. The light at one time and the smoke at another might betray me to those who I knew were ever ready to pursue and arrest me. Hunger eats through stone walls, says the proverb, and an empty stomach is a petitioner whose solicitations cannot be refused if there is anything to satisfy them with. Having regained the woods in safety, I ventured to go as far as the side of a swamp, which I knew to be at the distance of two or three hundred yards by the appearance of the timber. When in the swamp I felt pretty secure, but determined that I would never again attempt to travel in the neighborhood of a plantation in the daytime. When in the swamp a quarter of a mile, I collected some dry wood, and lighted it with the aid of my tinder-box, flint, and steel. This was the first fire that I kindled on my journey, and I was careful to burn none but dry wood to prevent the formation of smoke. Here I roasted my corn, and ate as much of it as I could. After my dinner I lay down and slept for three or four hours. When I awoke the sun was scarcely visible through the tree-tops. It was evening, and prudence required me to leave the swamp before dark, lest I should not be able to find my way out. Approaching the edge of the swamp I watched the going down of the sun, and noted the stars as they appeared in the heavens. I had long since learned to distinguish the North Star from all the other small luminaries of the night, and the seven pointers were familiar to me. These heavenly bodies were all the guides I had to direct me on my way, and as soon as the night had set in I commenced my march through the woods, bearing as nearly due east as I could. I took this course for the purpose of getting down the country as far as the road leading from Augusta to Morgan County with the intention of pursuing the route by which I had come out from South Carolina, deeming it more safe to travel the high road by night than to attempt to make my way at random over the country, guided only by the stars. I traveled all night, keeping the North Star on my left hand as nearly as I could, and passing many plantations, taking care to keep at a great distance from the houses, I think I traveled at least twenty-five miles to-night without passing any road that appeared so wide or so much beaten as that which I had traveled when I came from South Carolina. This night I passed through a peach orchard, laden with fine ripe fruit, with which I filled my pockets and hat, and before day, in crossing a cornfield, I pulled a supply of roasting ears, with which, and my peaches, I retired at break of day to a large wood into which I travelled more than a mile before I halted. Here, in the midst of a thicket of high whortleberry bushes, I encamped for the day. I made my breakfast upon roasted corn and peaches, and then lay down and slept, unmolested, until after twelve o'clock, when I awoke and rose up for the purpose of taking a better view of my quarters. But I was scarcely on my feet when I was attacked by a swarm of hornets, that issued from a large nest that hung on the limb of a tree within twenty or thirty feet of me. I knew that the best means of making peace with my hostile neighbors was to lie down with my face to the ground, and this attitude I quickly took, not, however, before I had been stung by several of my assailants, which kept humming through the air about me for a long time, and prevented me from leaving this spot until after sundown, after they had retired to rest for the night. I now commenced the attack on my part, and taking a handful of dry leaves, approached the nest, which was full as large as a half-bushel, and thrusting the leaves into the hole at the bottom of the nest, through which its tenants passed in and out, secured the whole garrison prisoners in their own citadel. I now cut off the branch upon which the nest hung, 
and threw it with its contents into my evening fire, over which I roasted a supply of corn for my night's journey. Commencing my march this evening, soon after nightfall, I travelled until about one o'clock in the morning, as nearly as I could estimate the time by the appearance of the stars, when I came upon a road, which, from its width and beaten appearance, seemed to be the road to Morgan County. After travelling for a day or two near this road, I at last found myself at daybreak one morning in sight of the home of my late master's friend, spoken of in our journey to Savannah. I was desperately hungry, and the idea swayed me to throw myself upon his generosity and beg for food. It seemed to me that this gentleman was too benevolent a man to arrest and send me back to my cruel mistress, and yet how could I expect or even hope that a cotton planter would see a runaway slave on his premises and not cause him to be taken up and sent home? Failing to seize a runaway slave when he has him in his power is held to be one of the most dishonorable acts to which a southern planter can subject himself. Nor should the people of the North be surprised at this. Slaves are regarded in the South as the most precious of all earthly possessions, and at the same time as a precarious and hazardous kind of property, in the enjoyment of which the master is not safe. The planters may well be compared to the inhabitants of a national frontier, which is exposed to the inroads of hostile invading tribes. Where all are in like danger and subject to like fears, it is expected that all will be governed by like sentiments and act upon like principles. I stood and looked at the house of this good planter for more than an hour after the sun had risen, and saw all the movements which usually take place on a cotton plantation in the morning. Long before the sun was up, the overseer had proceeded to the field at the head of the hands. The black women who attended to the cattle and milked the cows had gone to the cowpen with their pails, and the smoke ascended from the chimney of the kitchen before the doors of the great house were opened or any of the members of the family were seen abroad. At length two young ladies opened the door and stood in the freshness of the morning air. These were soon joined by a brother, and at last I saw the gentleman himself leave the house and walk toward the stables that stood at some distance from the house on my left. I think even now that it was a foolish resolution that emboldened me to show myself to this gentleman. It was like throwing oneself in the way of a lion who is known sometimes to spare those whom he might destroy. But I resolved to go and meet this planter at his stables and tell him my whole story, Issuing from the woods, I crossed the fields, unperceived by the people at the house, and going directly to the stables, presented myself to their proprietor, as he stood looking at a fine horse in one of the yards. At first he did not know me, and asked me whose man I was. I then asked him if he did not remember me, and named the time when I had been at his house. I then told at once that I was a runaway that my master was dead, and my mistress so cruel that I could not live with her, not omitting to show the scars on my back, and to give a full account of the manner in which they had been made. The gentleman stood and looked at me more than a minute without uttering a word, and then said, I will not betray you, but you must not stay here. It must not be known that you were on this plantation, or that I saw and conversed with you. However, as I suppose you are hungry, you may go to the kitchen and get your breakfast with my house servants. He then set off for the house, and I followed, but turning into the kitchen, as he ordered me, I was soon supplied with a good breakfast of cold meat, warm bread, and as much new buttermilk as I chose to drink. Before I sat down to breakfast, the lady of the house came into the kitchen with her two daughters, and gave me a dram of peach brandy. I drank this brandy, and was very thankful for it, but I am fully convinced now that it did me much more harm than good, and that this part of the kindness of this most excellent family was altogether misplaced. Whilst I was taking my breakfast, a black man came into the kitchen, 
and gave me a dollar that he said his master had sent me, at the same time laying on the table before me a package of bread and meat, weighing at least ten pounds, wrapped up in a cloth. On delivering these things, the black man told me that his master desired me to quit his premises as soon as I finished my breakfast. This injunction I obeyed, and within less than an hour after I entered this truly hospitable house, I quitted it forever, but not without leaving behind me my holiest blessings upon the heads of its inhabitants. It was yet early in the morning when I regained the woods on the opposite side of the plantation from that by which I had entered it. End of chapter 15